to give just some brief background, um, 20th century composer William Grant Still was born on May 11, 1895 in Woodville, Mississippi and died on December 3rd, 1978 in Los Angeles, California. Although much more widely recognized today, William Grant Still proves to hold many firsts, not only as composer and musician, but also as a person of color. In fact, William Grant Still was the first person of color to have a major work performed by a major American symphony orchestra, to conduct a major American symphony orchestra, to write the theme music for a World's Fair, to conduct a symphony orchestra in the Deep South, to conduct on national radio, to arrange a national radio program, to have an opera done by a major American symphony, to have an opera televised, and to write for the United Nations. And in addition to this, William Grant Still is also the first person of color in the field of classical music to have a documentary done for television, to have a sold-out recording, and to be invited by the White House. And if this wasn't enough, William Grant Still has um, was also the first person of color to cross over jazz and blues into the concert hall, introduce many jazz and band instruments to the concert hall, and many, many, many more firsts. It is undeniable that William Grant still has had an immense impact on the world of American music, and the fact that his name is not more widely recognized is to a certain degree a disservice. This is why we are so excited today to share a little bit about his life and his music. We'd like to begin today's lecture recital with the performance of William Grant Still's Romance, written for alto saxophone and piano. Um, which will be formed by Coltrane and Ting over here. And we are very thankful to be brought out here today by San Jose State University in helping to celebrate Black History Month and to celebrate the music and life of William Grant Still. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank 
A very big thank you to Coltrane and Ting for performing. Uh, and this was actually my mistake. I actually performed two pieces right now. That was the Romance by William Grant Still, as well as Quit and Voyage, also written um, uh, by William Grant Still. 
Now, as mentioned earlier, Still was born in Woodville, Mississippi to William Gant Still Sr. and Carrie Fambro Still. Although rare for African Americans in the late 1800s, both Still's parents were actually college educated and both college teachers at the Alabama Industrial College in Normal, Alabama. The family would then move to Woodville, Mississippi and see the birth of William Gant Still Jr. in May of 1895. His father would go on to pass only six months later at the age of 24. Still's mother would then take um, Still to Little Rock, Arkansas, where they would move in with her own mother. She would then later remarry. Often throughout the house, Still's grandmother would sing spirituals and hymns, exposing a young Still to music constantly. Additionally, Still would also listen to recordings of opera that his step stepfather would play for him. His stepfather would also bring him to live performances and even purchase Still's rich violin. Still would ultimately combine these traditions throughout his life, weaving together traditional Black American music with a European classical approach. Still would remain in Little Rock until he graduated high school as valedictorian at the age of 16. Although he eventually convinced his mother that music was a worthwhile career, she was very adamant that he pursue a career in the medical field. This would lead Still to begin his studies in medicine at Wilber Wilberforce University in Wilberforce, Ohio. While going throughout his studies in medicine, Still considered his passion for music and quickly found himself running the band program at the university. During this time, Still would spend many hours teaching himself how to play every instrument. But, uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Still would not go on to graduate from Wilberforce, but instead left the, deg the degree program in 1915 to perform professionally in various bands and orchestras throughout Columbus, Ohio. A year passed, and Still eventually found himself moving to Memphis to work as an arranger with American composer and songwriter W.C. Handy, who is often referred to as the father of the blues. By 1917, Still received a modest inheritance from his father, which he used to begin studying theory and violin at Oberlin College. After briefly serving in the Navy at the end of World War I, Still would then return to work for W.C. Handy again, however, this time in New York. While residing in New York, Still performed actively in the Broadway show Shuffle Along, which we'll discuss more later. Still would then leave briefly to Boston to study briefly at the New England Conservatory of composer George W. Chadwick, who insisted on tutoring him free of charge. After that, Still would then return to New York, where he learned that um, Edgar uh, Burris, a seminal French modernist composer, was searching for a Black American composer and tutor. Still would jump at this offer. However, ultimately still would reject the abstract sounds of modernism. William Gant Still, although journeyed through various musical worlds, would eventually return to the sound that he was pleased with, continuing to embrace and blend, embrace and blend African American traditional melodies with European methods to bring to the concert stage. In 1930, Still began his Afro-American symphony, which would be his breakthrough work. To this day, the piece continues to be widely regarded as one of Still's most performed and popular pieces. It was performed with the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra in 1931, and would be the nation's first major classical composition by a Black composer to be performed. In 1934, Still won a Guggenheim Fellowship, allowing him to move to Los Angeles and be begin composing for the world of Hollywood. The mid-1930s would see many firsts for Still, including being the first African-American composer to lead a major orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl, and to be the first person of color to conduct a symphony orchestra in the Deep South. 1949, however, would see a decline in the career of William Grant Still, and the same year his audiences, oh, uh, excuse me, sorry, the same year his opera, Trouble Island, was premiered. Although celebrated by audiences, critics were less enthusiastic about the piece, causing hardship for Still. Commissions diminished, fear performances of his music, and declining record offers. Still have continued to write music for television during this hardship. Eventually, the cloud of public dis uh, disapproval lifted, and his, and, uh, and ha his music has been continuously celebrated since his death on December 3rd, 1978. This is the life of William Grant Still, a man who aimed to bring the music of his traditions to the concert stage, to be taken seriously as any other composer. The next piece in our program is William Grant Still's Lyric Quartet, originally written for String Quartet um, in 1960. We will actually be performing this arrangement uh, for saxophone quartet. Um, this is a three movement work, um, and this piece is actually subtitled Musical Portraits of Three Friends, with each friend having their own distinct personality. The first movement is entitled the uh, sentimental one, the second movement is the quiet one, and the last and third movement is titled the jovial one. We hope that as we move through the piece, you can get a sense of each of these different distinct personalities through each movement.
So that was the first movement of William Grant Still's Lyric Quartet, uh, the sentimental one. So now the question arises of, excuse me, how did we find William Grant Still writing the romance for saxophone and piano? Well, interesting enough, the romance was the last of only four original works that he composed for solo instrument and piano. Considering Still's long-spanning music career to have only written four solo instrumental works and one of those be for the saxophone proves to be a great achievement for our instrument. However, this has not happened merely by happenstance. In order to gain a little in more insight, we must look a little into the life of German saxophonist Sigurd Rascher. Born in Germany on May 15, 1907, Sigurd Rascher proved to be one of the most leading pioneers for the concert saxophone in the 20th century, having pieces written for him by leading composers such as Jacques Ibert and Alexander Glazunov. If it were not for Sigurd Rascher, much of the repertoire written for our instrument would not exist, and the state of our instrument might be much more different today than we find it. Nonetheless, throughout the 1940s and 50s, Rascher found himself very active in promoting the concert saxophone. During his travels, he attended the American Symphony Association League Convention in Springfield, Ohio, where the guest speaker was none other than William Grant Still. Still had received an honorary doctor of humanities and music from Bates College a few days prior and spoke on the topic toward a broader American culture, where he can be seen discussing the promotion of nationalism through music. Mr. Rasher went on to write Still to express how impressed he was with the lecture, saying, I wanted to write to you that I have many times thought of the address you gave in Springfield at the Orchestra League Convention. Something in the way you presented this address, as well as what you said, left a deep impression in me. I do sincerely hope that I will have the privilege to meet you soon again and talk about these things. And my sincere and deep hope is that you will feel that the saxophone is just the instrument you want to write some music for. Mr. Brasher unfortunately did not hear back from Still for quite a bit until he would go on to send some performance recordings of himself playing the saxophone. Still was amazed by Rasher's ability and wrote a letter back in August of 1954 stating, you really are an artist. When I hear you play the saxophone, I realize suddenly that this is an instrument to which people have paid too little attention to up to now. <clears throat> the project of this would be the romance for alto saxophone and piano we heard earlier. Within their correspondence, Rasher would mention a second half of the work, which would become Still's Quit That Full Niche. Rasher would mention in one of these letters in the year 1954 that he planned to perform the romance during his upcoming tour of New York Michigan, Nebraska, Montana, and Washington. While the romance can be seen as a very idiomatic piece to the saxophone, as well as much more focused on melody, Quit That Foolish is much more focused on technical virtuosity. As stated previously, Quit That Foolish was written originally for piano, to then uh, later be arranged for alto saxophone and piano accompaniment as a second half to the romance. In addition to this, it was written for a friend of Still who was struggling with alcoholism, but due to somewhat embarrassing nature of the dedication, so would go on to say that this piece was instead dedicated to his daughter. Many believe that the two works, the romance and quit that fullness, were possibly the beginnings of a suite for saxophone. However, if that was the case, it was never completed. We will now continue with the second movement of Still's Lyric Quartet, um, titled The Quiet One. I think.
Thank you. Something that I'd like to go over when examining the music and notoriety of William Grant Still's music, and even works by other African American musicians and composers, is the alleged influence by white composers such as George Gershwin, for example. Some go on to claim, even in academic publications, that George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue helped inspire William Grant Still to make use of jazz and African American folk song in his symphonies and operas. However, it is and should be well known that George Gershwin, alongside other white composers at the time, would often frequent any and all performances in Harlem after their own respective performances to listen, and I quote, make mental notes and absorb this style. It is undeniable that these frequent visits would influence their subsequent compositions, such as Rhapsody in Blue. Considering this, it is almost inevitable that Gershwin would attend some of the early concerts in which William Grant Still's music was featured, or performances that Still would perform in himself. In fact, Still performed in a popular musical production titled Shuffle Along, an oboe in New York around this time. As performance would go, the performer, uh, as the performance would go on, the performers in the orchestra would eventually grow tired of playing the same figures over and over again, so often they would be seen improvising. Most of the performers had their own special figure they would add to the music. In the case of Still, his was quite melodic. Later, when he would go on to write arguably his most popular work, the Afro-American Symphony, he used the small figure mentioned earlier. Apparently, at the same time Still was composing his Afro-American Symphony, Gershwin was writing his piece titled Girl Crazy, which featured the song I Got Rhythm. This song would have similar material to that of Still's Afro-American Symphony, in particular, the melodic idea he used uh, to use in his performance of Shuffle Along. It is only natural that public attention would be brought to both the Afro-American Symphony and I Got Rhythm at the same time due to the close proximity of their compositions. Naturally, people who have heard more about Gershwin um, than Still assumed that the latter copied the former. When viewing both George Gershwin and William Grant Still as composers, the differences proved to be quite obvious. Gershwin approached African-American music as an outsider, and his own concepts helped make a fusion that was much more aimed at the public eye and stereotyped racially. William Grant Still's approach to African American music, on the other hand, was from within, refining and developing it with a craftsmanship and an inspiration of elevating it to the concert hall. We'd like to wrap up today with the last movement of Still's uh, lyric quartet, the jovial one. We'd like to thank you all so much for coming today. Um, we had a great time celebrating and learning about the life and music of William Grant Still. And um, just thank you so much.
There's a lot of food over there also, if you guys would like to grab some food. Thank you so much for coming out today. Yeah, what did you read or Oh, yeah. We are the Echo Saxophone Quartet. If you'd like to follow us, we have an Instagram, at Echo Quartet. Um, we are all saxophone performance majors here at San Jose State University under the direction of Dr. Michael Hernandez, who's right there in the back. Um, but thank you all so much for coming out today. If you have any questions, please come up to us. We'd love to answer them. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, that's what I have to say wrong with the 